see all kinds of changes going on now. I have a section I want to talk about in services, and education will be one, but uh, given I've got a CPA, I can talk about accountants, I can talk about uh, real estate people, I can talk about uh, doctors, and all of these services are really, we better be looking about the future because there's big changes being made. Number one being a lot of this stuff can be done on the internet. And so the, the type of delivery service is, is quite different. Okay, what I've done today is I want to start off uh, uh, with uh, business strategy and uh, I want to talk about strategic planning to begin with. And for, oh, probably 15 years, I've taught mass sections of principles of marketing to 250 to 300 students in sections. Uh, and uh, so this is wonderful. You know, <laughs> you know, yeah. Do this as well. Okay. And uh, I've developed uh, a lecture over time on, on business strategy. There's no marketing textbook that I know of that has ever covered that way. But I think that marketing, as much as I like it, now remember I do have a degree in accounting, so that gives me a little way there in terms of controversy and, and how you deal with things. But uh, uh, big, big changes. So anyway, I want to talk about strategy and, and I've got three points there. And then I want to talk about some of the service areas and some of the retailing areas because I look at both of those, in particular retailing, in terms of the, of the changes that are going on in retailing, the internet impact of that, uh, etc. And uh, when we do get into selling, all I can, uh, into uh, uh, the service area, all I can say is, at least my experience, that is that as a change agent or a preliminary change agent, change is not always very acceptable in organizations when you're satisfied with whatever the status quo is. And so we have all kinds of new technologies and new ways of looking at things, so I'll go through some of that pretty fast. Okay, let's start off. Uh, with strategic planning, and uh, I want to talk about these three concepts. Okay? First concept is what is called core competency. What are you good at? And what you're good at, you ought to do more. Now, you need to decide what that may be. Second, if it's, if it's not, you're not particularly skilled in that area, let somebody else do it. So here we get to the outsourcing. Now I know we've got all kinds of outsourcing that doesn't work or what have you, but from a common sense point of view, uh, we have that. And then the important thing is how do we get a sustainable competitive advantage? Okay. Let's look at some of that. Core competency. I want to put up IBM. Cost. I didn't, by the way, I have about eight articles over here with about 15 copies of articles that I consider to be pioneering or addressing some of these issues. So afterwards, if you want to pick up uh, one of those, I've got about 15 copies over there. Okay, one of, one of them is on IBM. And we look at their core competency and what they're good at, and it changes over time. You remember, they were the mainframe people for years, and when they came out with the IBM PC, the IBM people were big supporters of that because they were mainframe people, okay? Now they bought out uh, which consulting? Price Waterhouse Consulting Company, one of the big uh, uh, accounting firms, consulting in turn. And then they've gone into cloud software, and I will guarantee you the service of that versus the physical product of selling computers where would they be today if they had said, we're the computer people and that's what we do and we're not gonna change? Let me tell you one organization that did that and they're in terrible shape. They are called Eastman Kodak. We're the camera people and we don't have to change because everybody needs camera. Where, go, go and look at what Eastman Kodak is doing right now. They are not doing well at all for a well-known uh, type of situation. So this is just an example, for example, of, of I could give a number of companies. Uh, one company I like to talk about, I'll do just briefly, is the Pappas family here in Houston. 
they have been outstanding in terms of Papa Seelers and Papa Dose and so forth and so on. And I always love to ask the students, you know, why do you go to a Papa Seelers and you can get a Greek salad? Because the Papas are Greek. <laughs> but you think about it. And it, it's interesting that uh, over time when I had 250, 300 students and I asked them how many of you ever worked for Papas and at that amount there's always somebody that has been wage staff, this type of deal. And I say to them, well, uh, how much training did you do? Well, man, hey, we had to do this for 20 hours or what have you. Well, do other restaurants do that? No, or at least not to the same extent. So if, if having good wage service and employees, you know, there are other things you could, you could argue of why. Take, take an issue like Papa's. Why are they so successful? Because they're not, they're up in Denver now. They're, in, they're out of Texas <laughs> as, as well. And they started here in Houston many, many, many years ago. And you say, well, they have good food. Well, any restaurant, if they don't have good food, is not going to be there very long. So that doesn't discriminate too much. Do they have good service? Yes, they probably have better service. Okay. What else? They're brilliant at real estate. They don't buy the cheapest location. They buy it on all the interstates and the, and the traffic type of deal that they have. And you can go on and on and on. So I like to use that as an example of at least a local company uh, and uh, I had a manager of one of the Papas a number of years ago when I taught a night course and he was coming back and he was manager and he just said man they are making money like you would not believe okay. so they're a private company so we really don't know okay but the notion is what are you good at all right sustainable competitive advantage what can we do to gain advantage in the long run that is sustainable, okay, that I, I can't be duplicated real easily, this type of thing. All right, I've got my laundry list. Digging a moat strategy. Who's ever heard of a moat strategy? Oh my God, that's <laughs> Berkshire Hathaway. A moat strategy, hey, we're gonna do like they do in the 17th century in uh, Europe. How do we keep competitors from coming in and taking our business? We build a bigger moat, a deeper moat. We keep them from coming in and attacking us. Okay. By the way, I've got an article on that. <laughs> <laughs> Berkshire Hathaway. And I can tell you that uh, I'm a big fan, a fan of Warren Buffett. And uh, uh, years ago, I decided I wanted to go to the stock owner meeting, so I bought some stock a little. Okay. In fact, my grandson, who just is starting uh, up at College Station two weeks ago, one week ago, uh, when he was six months old, we bought some shares of Berkshire Hathaway B, that, that, that where they divided his property, for a little over $5,000, and it's there for his college fund. Now, 18 years later, uh, that stock for him, for a college, is now worth about $34,000. And I want him to pay the capital gains. <laughs> Not me. And I'm sure Carl has got some legal way that if you go to college, that you can, you can, you can deal with that. That's okay. Uh, I, 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 Dr. Cox, let me inject this real quick. Uh, uh, Warren Buffett was on campus, this is several years ago, and. I was there a week or two later with Dr. Cox and Bill Sherrill and Bob Casey on an entrepreneurship matter or something. So we're walking down the hall, in the hall and Dr. Cox says, you know, I've got a few years, of, a few shares of Berkshire Hathaway and eight or 10, 12 shares, whatever. And so when I went home, I was thinking, gosh, yeah, that poor professor, you know, I've had him there and they don't make all that much. And so about Three or four weeks later, I was in there and they have a big ticker tape up in the business college in Berkshire Hathaway per share, like 650000 or something, some crazy number. And I thought, no, oh, look, he's got six shares. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it had to be my accounting back. <laughs> 
Wow. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, second, uh, let me see, do I have that? Well, okay. I, I just give a list here. Okay. Obtain a strong competitive advantage, fend off existing and new challenges, isolate the firm from competition, maintain a low cost structure. These are a number of things of how you build a moat. <laughs> how do you keep all those competitors and those new guys from coming in and taking your business? Okay. It's well worth uh, reading some of that stuff. Okay. Now, branding. Oh, before I get to branding, patents and copyrights are very, very valuable. Okay, but they don't always uh, uh, last uh, forever. Okay, I noticed that Lipitor just went off, and they were in the billions of dollars, and now they've withdrawn from the marketplace because their their uh, competitive advantage in terms of having a copyright has has expired. How does Coca-Cola maintain their formula? It tastes the same, I think, but maybe they change it up enough to be able to keep what their patent. Well, I want to talk about Coca-Cola and branding. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, HEB is giving them a good battle. Yeah. Uh, right now, otherwise the retailer, uh, see, 30, 40 years ago, uh, the, the big brands were all by the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, today, boy, big retailers have huge uh, changes that are going on. We love HEB brands better than the Fritos, for example, but we like their stuff better. Well, if, if I had to ask you today, what do you think the best-selling dog food is in the United States a year or two ago, what would you say? Alpo. Purina. 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 Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, really? And Old Roy sorry, sorry. was uh, uh, Sam Walden's dog. Oh, was it? Uh, <laughs> uh, oh. So when we talk about branding, there's been a tremendous shift from manufacturers being dominant right. to the retailer being dominant. Right. And there's good reasons for some of that changes that are, that are taking place. Which is just says just because we got the market now doesn't mean we're going to have it for years and years and years. Okay, well, so here, mass media, universe of shattered. I have an article, and it's an old article. It's uh, up here, but it's brilliant in terms of how change has has helped the retail brand along versus competing with the manufacturing brand. Uh, mass media it used to be in the 1960s. We had three national TV deals, ABC, CBS, and NBC. And if you wanted to advertise, you advertise there and you could cover 90% of the market. You can't do that anymore with advertising and the, and the media. It's, it's, it's diverse, okay? Mass channels have consolidated. A lot of your small retailers have gone under and they've gone to your big chains and your big uh, discount type stores. Uh, and, and those those stores have more power. As long as you had little little retail stores, they didn't have much power against the Coca Colas of this world and this type of thing. And then it's high gross margin for the store brand. So if you're in the retail business, look at all of the wonderful. You know, I, I go to Whole Foods and you know their whole private label there is what three sixty five. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And you think they don't sell a lot and they get bigger margins? Now, do they make the product? You could, you know. Kroger's makes a lot of its own, but most retailers, big retailers, will buy it from a small manufacturer that has excess capacity. And if you've got excess capacity, you're ready to make a deal. Okay? So, we see huge, huge, huge change going on. Okay. All right. Low cost. On the other end, and of course, Geico is owned by Berkshire Hathaway, uh, but I think it is absolutely fascinating what Geico has done in the marketplace, and that is they have shifted their whole expenditures from local agents who personally sold insurance to advertising with all their kooky ads. You know, you can argue whether you like them or not, but. <laughs> And 
with many of you in insurance, you don't change insurance policies every year <coughs> or banking account. There are certain things that we do that, unless we're extremely dissatisfied, we don't deal with change. Well, who do you deal with? Well, a lot of you deal with. There's the new people coming in that are in their 20s buying an automobile, buying a life insurance policy, et cetera, et cetera. So the millennials, millennia. By the way, it's very interesting that I got to spend six years on a census advisory committee back in the 1990s. So I just love this idea of the baby boomers, Generation X, Generation Y, millennials. But you haven't seen anything yet until we get to Generation Z. And Generation Z <laughs> stands for Zuckerberg, oh, Facebook. Uh, oh. And if all of those millennials think they got problems, wait until you see these eight and ten year olds climbing over their back in terms of what they want. So change is a continual deal, and how do we recognize and how do we use it? Okay, in terms of uh, Amazon.com, obviously, from the internet point of view, uh, whether you like it or, or dislike it, uh, has, has been very, very disruptive in terms of competition, and, and they are spending huge, huge, huge amounts of money uh, on that. Uh, okay, let's go from there, then, <coughs> to retail. Okay. And I want to look at retailing and say and, and selling. Uh, the two I could I could identify a, a, a lot more than that. Okay. Oh, by the way, uh, Berkshire Hathaway is extremely <coughs> profitable in terms of generating huge amounts of float. Now, what does the word float mean to you? Because if you haven't heard that, you need to learn that one. Is their cash in the bank sort of stuff yeah. that they're making money on? Hey, if I get my revenue before all my cost and I've got extra money, I can invest it. And boy, did Berkshire Hathaway do it in 2008 with some in big insurance companies and all, who, or, or banks that were about to go broke and, and needed money. And I noticed the other day that they just swung a deal with, I forgot which company it was, that. Uh, Three billion dollars worth of float that went in to buy these uh, bonds at a guaranteed nine percent return, and I just wish that if I could get a nine percent return on all my investments over a period of years, I, I would be kind of really happy yeah. on some of that. Okay, <laughs> so you have your internet sales, and then you've got your uh, what I what I call uh, concentrated niches, and. Uh, uh, in retailing, and let me see, did I put that down here? No, that's not, okay. I'll skip concentrated niches. I had a few, though, that I just love to talk about. Uh, Charming Charlies. <laughs> Who has not heard of Charming Charlies? You know, okay. <laughs> I'm using this as a Houston exam. Are you married, Kevin? <laughs> I'm going to tell Stephanie all about it. Well, we are you cluing in? So, uh, and, and, and I'm trying to use some Houston and Texas examples to be international. But Charlie, Charlie, I tried to get him to my class to teach, to speak, and I never could. He was out of town all the time, making millions of dollars. But here's a guy that's in retailing, and what is his his big success based on? Color coding. Color coding to women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my wife took me to see that. From a retailing point of view, absolutely. <laughs> For God's sake, here's this guy that is expanded and making money just because he put rings and ties and stuff together that were color coordinated. Dr. Cox, it's it's nice to buy the little lady a bobble or two once in a while. I don't really go into the truck and truck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Linda has you trained. Oh, congratulations, Linda. <laughs> One more in terms of a concentrated niche. So you don't have to be everything to everybody. So you're talking about a target market here. Is uh, Bucky's. 
You go around. Well, I asked students, here I've got the 250, 300 students, you know. How many of you have been to Bucky's? What's Bucky's known as? What is Bucky's? Clean restaurants. Clean restaurants. Clean restaurants. Yeah. You can hold it. That's right. That's, That's what the site tells me. billboard that says, you know, <laughs> San Antonio, 102 miles, you can hold it. <laughs> you can hold it. See, Bucky's in here. What I'm saying is think of the creative ways, though, of some geniuses in terms of, of, of recognizing needs here. Uh, over time. <laughs> Dr. Cox, you yes. mentioned blinds.com earlier. Blinds. I'm not there yet. Oh, I thought you were going to do that as a bitch. I thought that was oh, well, maybe I. Uh, it's on your next one, I think. You had mentioned it here when you were talk started talking about it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't have it in there. A mm -hmm. uh, uh, couple of, of internet type deals of uh, uh, blinds.com, and, and I put that in there too because it's the guy who started it is from Houston. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a really wonderful conceptual type of deal of, uh, for any type of blinds that you have. No inventory, okay, which helps you float. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, no inventory. The inventory issue in retailing is a huge one. Okay, and uh, what they do is they, uh, they'll make it to your specifications, your color, your size, your shape. Uh, and they're on the internet. They don't particularly have it. I don't think they have a store. At least they didn't start out with having a store. Home Depot bought them. Did Home Beat Depot bought them? Bought them. Okay, I did. Six months ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. I bet they paid a penny. Yeah, a, mm -hmm. a amount for that. But, uh, and then they pay commissions. They don't call it commissions, you know, to uh, uh, designers who come in and if you're redesigning a house and, and you know, get it okay that way there's kind of a commission for a uh, referral type of type deal in there and it's really a brilliant brilliant concept again using the internet okay. can you imagine going to a store nowadays that has physically all the different blind combinations in terms of sizes shapes colors what have you and the, the tremendous inventory mm -hmm. type of issue that you have there okay Thank you, I had forgotten. Okay. Ah, uh, online. Okay. Oh, well, here's three. The, the, the blinds is one. Warby Parker. Now, I have an article on Warby. How many of you have ever heard of Warby Parker? Ah, they sell glasses. Okay. And they got a couple of entrepreneurs up in New York, wherever it is. And it turns out that we have all kinds of retail stores that sell glasses. And we maybe have six or seven or eight of them, where virtually all of them are owned by an Italian company that makes it over there. And then you have all these companies, and they're selling for $200 a pair. And uh, Warby Parker comes in and sells it on the internet again for maybe $80. And by the way, when you buy it, we also provide a free one in third world countries for people who need glasses. Okay? All right, and that's an amazing concept too because now you're attacking, you know, you can say, well, when I buy glasses, I've got this company, this company, this company, a retailer, and if they're all owned by the same company, what do you think the pricing strategy is gonna be in terms of what it costs? Well, from their, their point of view, it's wonderful, but from the consumer point of view, now they do have some choices uh, on that. Uh, threadless, I, I didn't put that in, but that that is a, group on the internet a while back that sold t-shirts only. And what they did is every month they would have five different custom designed t-shirts. They would ask people to recommend it and then they would pick five out of whoever recommended it, sold them all out over the internet. Can you imagine how many, what size of inventory many places have that have t-shirts? And uh, they did very, and they sold the whole thing, okay? And then uh, the five they picked every year, they gave prizes or whatever, some incentive. And that's aimed mainly at the millennial, the millennial crowd in terms of t-shirts, okay? Very, very successful. All right.
changes in service. Uh, now, this is a sensitive area for many people because we have all kinds of services and we have all kinds of, gov uh, of rules. Okay. I'll take mine first, tenure. I think tenure is a wonderful concept that is being abused right now. Uh, because you've got school systems that have to downsize and have what, and if you have tenure, then we let the people who are the least number of years get get off, as opposed to some old timers about to retire or should have been retired 15 years before. Now I know evaluation of any employee is difficult, and it is not an easy type of situation. But I, now by the way, I'm probably within the 10 percent of college professors who have tenure who say it's not perfect. <laughs> but we have the same thing with, with other types of deals in terms of banking, in terms of uh, what well, the health services is the one in the news right now. And you know, if, when I read in the paper that uh, 20 years ago, uh, uh, medical schools 40% of the people that went to medical school were GP, general practitioners. Today, 15% are general practitioners. Now, why is that? Because there's more money in the specialist. <laughs> and when you've got two hospitals back to back with the same operation, and one charges twice as much as the other, that's not the normal marketplace, is it? I'm not saying good or bad. All I'm saying is that that it's a terribly difficult. We got the same problem with tenure, you know, in terms of, of, of uh, what we do. And by the way, I put over here uh, an article that is the oldest article I have. It's it's I don't know, 15 years ago, uh, uh, on lawyers. There was a Supreme Court rule. Well, first of all, lawyers, CPAs, doctors, and all are authorized by the state. That means we got 50 different rules, or at least the potential for doing that. Okay, and uh, with the, with the, that particular article talked about back in the 1950s, I think many of these state rules said that uh, with. Uh, that you couldn't advertise. If you advertised, you could be disbarred. Okay. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court. The legal question. <coughs> Lawyers. And the Supreme Court ruled, I think it was eight to one, it's, it's been a long time since you've had that majority, uh, that said uh, that uh, no, you can't be disbarred because of advertising. Both CPAs and lawyers for years have basically said, you know, uh, in my area of marketing, particularly, in particular advertising, that it's, it's illegal. Why is it illegal? Because uh, it's not fair. Well, okay, what happens when you can't advertise? All I know now is that I can pick up my Wall Street Journal and here is a full page ad for Price Waterhouse. Okay? Just from, in 1970, when I first started teaching at the University of Houston, I looked at the Houston Yellow Pages on, under attorneys. And what did I see? About 17 single space deal, about, about 17 pages of single space lawyer names alphabetized by their last name. Why? Because if I placed an ad in the Yellow Pages, I could be this far. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad, but at some time, we're going to look at our services and say we got we got this 50 different rules. Uh, well, we can we can agree that we'll let you do do it here and, you, and we can do it there and so forth. But the service area is really going to change, and one way is it's going to change is because you cannot inventory a service. Okay, that makes it a different animal in terms of what we do. Okay. And also, Dr. Cox, uh, it's okay for, for to give out pizzas at the emergency room 
I ran into Kevin and he was headed over to the emergency room. He had like 50 pizzas in the back seat of his car. He's going to hand them out to people as they walk through. <laughs> <laughs> you put your business card in the box. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And those of you, okay, the little ad that changed everything. This was an article in September 2002. So here it is. Uh, well, it's not that old. Okay, the little ad. The case has a profound impact on U.S. law practice. And we've had the same sort of thing with doctors. We did. Oh, big battle now between doctors and nurses. Okay. I ran into that a couple of years ago. Uh, we, we go up to Colorado, my my daughter's up there, and uh, we've gone to the YMCA of the Rockies for a number of years. And we, uh, she lives in Loveland, and we got up there, and my hearing aid, little plastic deal, got caught in my ear way down. Now, who wants to go for 10 days and have something stuck in your ear? Well, my daughter says, no problem. Right down to Walgreens, the wall, uh, Walgreens and they had a little uh, nursing deal, and she filled it out and did it. It took about uh, 30 seconds to get some tweezers and pull it out. Charged me $25, and I said, that is the best $25 I have ever spent. <laughs> but the doctors say, but that's not right because nurses aren't trained. We should have a law that says a doctor has to be in charge. All I'm saying is we're dealing in the marketplace with all kinds of interesting issues. Uh, I'm all for it. It depends upon whether you're a buyer or a seller. Okay? And if you're a buyer and it's a minor deal, and what do we see in Houston today in terms of little clinics and little, not serious uh, medical type of issues? They're growing like mad. CVS and Walgreens and those others are putting them in all over the place. I'm sure that some of the doctors don't like them. Okay. All right. All, but the major uh, deal is that there's going to be change. Okay. And I, I can't tell you what the good things and the bad good things are, but if you just say business as usual and we're going to do it this way, uh, well, maybe. Maybe not, but the internet is just changing so much of what we do. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, financial services, banks, etc. And I have this two-page on my deal. USAA. <coughs> now, <coughs> Bank of America may have 10,000 banks where you go and deposit. And I ask my students, how many of you go physically to a bank and do business and there are no hands? Uh, these are the millennials now. Okay. What are you going to do if you Bank of America and you got 10,000 banks? But the one that really, really works that one is the USAA battle where their target market is so clear-cut in terms of the military. And can you imagine in terms of selling insurance for the cars and the life insurance and the so forth in the medical area? So this is, article was 2010, and it's just two pages front and back. Uh, I encourage you, I've got some articles. But I, I love to watch the USA. With a military family, and, and I can't think of a better example of we know who our target market is in terms of. Okay. I do have one article on the future of higher education looks nothing like the present. Okay. And we have a tenure problem, but we also have a tremendous inflation money problem for the students. It, 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 it's across the board. It's not like in, in any particular uh, company and uh, university. And when you think, I went to a faculty meeting in the Bower College last year, and we're doing some strategic planning. And we had the faculty there. We had an hour and a half meeting, and the question was, gee, maybe we'll have fewer students. The revenue will fall. What can we do? What can we do? And in an hour and a half. I did not hear one faculty say, is there a way that we can do it cheaper, cost control? 
It just wasn't in their vocabulary. Well, we do know out in business that call it, that it's revenue minus cost equal profit, and that you need to work both sides of the street, not just one side of the street. Okay. Uh, anyway. All right. With that, uh, education, health. I, there's so much in the, in the uh, uh, health care deal going on now, major, major changes that most of us are kind of ignorant of, even know what the issues are. Uh, and it, and I, I, I don't myself, except that I, I would like to see more marketplace <laughs> economic decisions being made uh, as opposed to we are a privileged one and we have these laws that protect us so we can't do that or we can't do the other. It'll be interesting to see what happens in terms of the, of the service. Uh, with your professional services, your CPAs, I never sat for the CPA, I did get a mechanic degree, uh, but I will guarantee you that both my lawyers and CPAs, they have fought for years uh, in terms of uh, not permitting advertising and other uh, competitive ways in the marketplace. And uh, I wonder what's going to happen there uh, in the future in terms of, uh, of some of the professional services. Anyway, I've got an article or two uh, over there. Okay. Anyway, the whole notion is change. <coughs> Not good or bad, but how do we adapt to change? In terms, and, and the internet and some of the technology that we're developing now, there's a huge, huge, huge difference. All right. One of the characteristics I just put down, you have no inventory. Perfect for the internet. <laughs> Licensed by states in many cases, not always, but in many cases. And it, it's like uh, the doctors right now are, are feuding with the nurses. The doctor says, hey, you've got some of these simple type of deal nurses do, but you need a doctor in charge. Okay. Uh, I didn't see a doctor in Walgreens when they took that little stuff out of my ear saying, well, okay, that's self-preservation. But imagine if you required a doctor for everything that you do, for simple type of things. Okay. But they're vulnerable to new type of ideas and so forth. All right. Now, I want to finish up with this whole notion of mistakes. Well, I'll, uh, yeah, finish up with it. Okay. We all make mistakes. The question is, what do we do about them? Okay. Mistakes can be valuable. The worst mistake is to act like you didn't, didn't make mistakes. So, you know, the question is, what did you learn? And I had two examples here. First example I ran into. My brother works for NASA, did. He's retired now, but he put on a strategic planning deal for NASA. And we had to go up, and I went to one up in Colorado Springs, where you've got a lot of military and so forth. And all these NASA people had this big badge that says, failure is not an option. And I said, that is the biggest bunch of crap. Come on, guys. What are you talking about? NASA, the, you know, go wrong. Okay. All right, well, I have my answer to that. And that's Henry Ford. Those who have never made mistakes work for those of us who do. <laughs> I'll tell you, that's... Uh, but.